this nail and pray it. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come here today to worship you. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we're here together. We pray you would bless those who are attending our services on Zoom as well. We thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for your great love and your tender mercies. And we just thank you for bringing us through another week to this, to this holy day that you have given to us, your children. Help us, Lord, to walk with you day by day, moment by moment, we pray. And we know, Lord, in this world where there's so much going on, where, where there is so much moral and spiritual darkness that we need you every moment. We cannot afford to be without you for one single moment. Help us, Lord, to hold fast and may you hold us fast, Lord, we pray. And help us when we meet others to be able to speak a word for you, to show them your great love and the truth that you have for all who would listen. Lord, we pray you bless uh, Brother Mark today as he presents a message, and also Sister Shelley, Lord, as she presents a message as well. Be with them and bless them, and be with us each one here today, be with our families too, and we pray particularly for those who may be struggling in various circumstances of, in life, whether it be with health or with spiritual matters, you know which one, and we just pray for those silently in our hearts now, for those who we know are in need of your special touch. Thank you again for all your blessings. Be with us now, we pray. And we ask these things in the name of Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Craig. Now, I'd like, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to invite my wife, Shelley, up to do the health presentation. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everyone, Sabbath. here in person and on Zoom. So I just want to go through a recap first of my last time I was here. What did I talk on? Remember? Remember what I talked on? <laughs> no. I think we need mental. We need some memory, right? <laughs> How about the thymus? What does the thymus do? Do you remember? <laughs> Remind you. I think I need to bring memory pills. Exactly. Helps your immune system. There's two things that the immune that is in the thymus releases in your body. Do you know what they are? And they're very important for your immune system. <laughs> huh? Uh, T cells. What does the T stand for? Thank you. Thymus. What's the other cell? B cells. Why is it the B? What's the B stand for? Bone marrow. What does bone marrow release? Very good. All right. Now we can go on with... <laughs> We can go on with my slides. First of all, there was one thing I specifically mentioned in the last talk that's very important for your immune system. What is it? The gut is very important. That is where the immune system is, yes, but there's something else that you need to help with the gut. There was three things. There was a thymus. <laughs> Valgus nerve. Remember the valgus vagus nerve. Va vagus nerve. Do you remember that? Where is that located? No. No. Cranial. Okay. The cranial. It's the tenth nerve. Let's begin. A disturbed mind is doubt, perplexity, and excessive grief often sap the vital forces and induce nervous diseases of a most debilitating and distressing character. And that is so true. That's a review in Harold. So we began. 
This is the vagus nerve. Okay, it's the 10th of the 12 cranial nerves. It's located in the rear of the skull. It's despite the name, the vagus nerve is a pair of nerves on each side of the medulla oblongata. Do you know where that is? It's just below, just behind the ear here, in behind there, okay? It's a stem-like structure that makes up part of the brain stem. You have one vagus nerve on each side of your body that travels all the way from your brain to your gut. Doctors say that this is the longest of the cranial nerves in your body. The name vagus nerve comes from the word for wandering. This is a fitting word, sorry, fitting name because the cranial nerve has so many connections and branches throughout the body. What does the vagus nerve do? Looks like I have to click. Okay. Oh, conveys sensory information about the body's organs and central nervous system. As the okay. interacts with autonomic, uh, sorry, autonomic body processes like blood pressure and heart rate. Affects moods and seizures. Vagus nerve functions your appetite. The effect of vagus nerve functions on your digestive system, can also control your appetite. The journal Gastroenterology reports that vagus activity plays a role in regulating your appetite. It also can cause obesity when it's damaged. Other studies point to the fact that a properly functioning vagus nerve also increases feelings of, if I pronounce that correctly, satiety. Okay. For those who don't know what this is, it means being gratitude to the fullness. Your vagal tone helps to transport signals to your brain, making you feel fuller and may help prevent you from overeating. However, researchers explain that the vagus nerve function is extremely complex and complicated and there's little evidence to suggest that the vagus nerve stimulation helps to treat obesity. They don't know for sure, but I'm done. Vagus nerve function affects inflammation. So many people have inflammation, don't we? Well, I bet you we even have inflammation in our bodies. <clears throat> An important reason to make sure that you have good vagal tone is to reduce inflammation in your body. Why? Why would you want to reduce inflammation in your body? What does inflammation cause? Huh? Exactly. Causes disease. Now it's only it's okay to have short term inflammation, but not chronic inflammation, because it leads to diseases, allergies, diabetes, and cancer. Studies into the way the vagus nerve functions have shown that it helps lower inflammatory responses. Scientists theorize that enhancing the vagus nerve function can help manage inflammation related diseases. Yeah. Vagus nerve function and your internal organs. Your left and right vagus nerve are connected to most of your internal organs that help them function properly. For example, the cardiology journal reports on a study showing that an increase in vagus activity can help reduce heart failure. There's a lot of heart failure up there. I think it's actually the second, or is it the first one? I think it's heart failure is the first and then second. Cancer. Doctors found that using a device to stimulate the vagus nerve increased nitric oxygen. You guys remember me speaking about nitric oxide in my talks? Okay. Levels and lowered inflammation. Both of these are important in boosting your heart health. Research also shows that vagal nerve activity So healthy vagal nerve function is also necessary for the kids to work properly. <coughs> Studies have shown that patients that suffer with migraine headaches have impaired vagal activity. Depending on the frequency of vagal stimulation, we know it can turn off an asthma attack, an epileptic seizure, a migraine, or even a cluster headache. And it can reduce this perception of acid reflux. Low vagal tone, poor vagal tone has been associated with child psychopathology and anxiety and Very important, isn't it? Very important. 
Lower vagal tone is linked to a variety of problems. Let's see what they are. Anxiety, depression, mood disorders, headaches, migraines, poor satiety, or inability to relax while eating, insomnia, interrupted sleep, poor breathing patterns, loneliness, dysregulated overactive hypothalamic pituitary uh, adrenal and axis, which is very important because if that's not balanced, that can also lead to anxiety and depression as well. Hypochlorohydride, low stomach and secretion of acid, gallbladder issues, low or slow bile and production, making it harder to digest fats and clear toxins. <clears throat> Dysposis, constipation, intestinal bacterial overgrowth, poor absorption of nutrients, digestion and GI problems, such as IBS, hiatal hernia, chronic fatigue, food sensitivities. Well, I think everybody has these, one of them, right? Doug, if you can't see, you wanna come over, you can over there. It's okay? You're in the middle. I know, that's why I'm- One way, another way. I'm one of you want to sit there you and then you- You sit down. <laughs> yeah, you come over there though. Okay. Poor blood flow to kidneys. Frequent urination, high blood pressure, poor glucose control. Look how much this controls, you know, so much to the body. Has anybody ever heard of it? No. I guess nerve, no. Ah. Poor heart rate, variability, greater risk of cardiovascular conditions, heart disease, stroke, high resting heart rate, cognitive impairment. Chronic inflammation, greater rates of inflammatory conditions, food all, not some all autoimmune diseases, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid conditions, inflammatory bowel disease, vagus nerve irritation, inflammation, and damage. Any kind of GI distress can put pressure on the nerve and irritates it, with a hiatal hernia being a frequent culprit. Chronic stress and anxiety can inflame the nerve. So how important is it to not have chronic stress? Sure, we have stress. You can have short-term stress, but you don't want chronic. <clears throat> Anxiety, it inflames the nerve. If you had even braces for an extent amount of dental work, you're at risk for low vagal tone. Even simple this is what I want in my business, can cause the vagus nerve to misfire. The vagus nerve, can prescriptions, OTC, recreational drug, upper respiratory viral infections, Botox injections, heavy metal toxicity, or having part of the nerve damage or severed accidentally during surgery or an operation. Vagal tone is passed on from mother to child. So mothers... It's very important that you keep your anxiety and depression and anger low during your pregnancy. Mothers who experience that can pass it on to their child. And the newborn baby also has low vagal tone and low dopamine and serotonin, serotonin levels. So when they have that, it also, you know, um, then the baby starts having issues. There might be issues with colic. And some of this is because what the mother um, had beforehand. So it just shows you it carries over. Three ways to checking your health of your vagus nerve. Now, honey, come up here, please. Okay, so this is a way, did you, you know, I did not know this, it's very interesting. Do you know when you went and saw the doctor? Well, before in the past, I don't know if they do too much anymore, but you go to the doctors, right? And they have you open up your mouth and what are they checking? No, they're actually checking your vulva, okay? So the evolva is that little thing in the back. If you see, uh, sorry, not evil uvula. Uvula, you see in the thing in the back. And so that actually, see this, okay? This is what they're checking, uvula, okay? That needs to be in the center. If that's in the center, that means your vagus nerve is good, okay? If it's off to the side, it's not. 
So when we go ah uh, and I check, so I want I'm gonna Michael go ah. Uh -uh. No, you don't put your mouth on uh -uh. me. I gotta look. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> These are really silly. Okay. Oh, sorry. Can you see in Zoom? I gotta have it. So you gotta go ah. Uh -uh. Okay, it's good. Now what you're gonna see too, and you want to do it with a flashlight. So yeah, so you can see. Thank you. So Michael's is good, but some people. They, it might not even move and it will be off to the side. And that means that it is, it's not healthy. Okay. So I just learned that. I thought that was interesting. So in order to check this, we advise don't look at it yourself, but you know, the flashlight and someone else look for you. And we all have flashlights on our phones. So <laughs> we could do that too. This is two other ways. I found very interesting how you can test it as well. This is where you measure your heart rate variability. Your heart rate variability, variation time between each heartbeat, is a measure of vagus nerve activity and can be used to measure the effectiveness of vagus nerve stimulation exercises. The higher it is, the better. A vagal tone measuring device you can use complete that is a smartwatch. A vagus nerve, another one is sesame seeds, okay? So what you do is you would take some sesame seeds and you won't chew it, okay? You just want to just swallow it. And Dr. Natalia recommends is sesame seed transit time. To perform, consume all sesame seeds in a glass of water in your stools. It should take 12 to 20 hours. Anything less or more than it indicates a poor vagal tone. Because remember, your vagal is important to your digestion. Now, what is a healthy vagal tone? What does it look like? Higher vagal tones link to an increased resilience to stress. Reduce elastic load, the amount of stress we accumulate over time. Less anxiety and healthier emotional, physical, and psychological well being. A high vagal tone improves the function of many body systems, causing improved digestion, better production of stomach acids digestive enzymes, less migraines, better blood sugar regulation, reduce risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease, and lowers your blood pressure. One of the most interesting roles of the vagus nerve is that it activates your gut microbiome, which is very important for the brain as well, and initiates a response to modulate inflammation. So the more good uh, gut bacteria in your gut, the less inflammation you have. Those with higher vagal tone have healthier hearts and less inflammation, stronger social bonds, greater ability to feel calm and peaceful. Is this real calm and peaceful? Oh, we must not have a lot of people don't have very good vagal tones, do they? People with high vagal tone are not just healthier, but they're social, they're psychologically stronger, better able to concentrate and remember things. Oh. Oh, remember things. I think every one of us uh, <laughs> have low vagal tones here. <laughs> oh, don't worry, I'm part of it. Concentrate, remember things, happier and likely to be depressed. More empathetic and more likely to have close friendships. When your variability is high, your vagal tone is so high. So how do you stimulate your vagus nerve? Think of your vagus nerve stimulation as a kind of a mental hygiene that requires consistency and regular practice to be most effective. Well, guess what? The wonderful thing is you guys can do this yourself at home. And we even do it here at church. Ooh, doesn't that look cold? Oh, yes. Doesn't that look wonderful? Has anybody tried this? Have you ever went into ice pool water? Have you ever ended with a cold shower? Do you put cold water in your face in the morning? Good. These are ways of helping your vagal tone. Cold feet? Yeah. Why you have cold feet in the morning? Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. No, no, cold, put cold, cold, a face, cold face cloth on your face. Put cold yeah. water in your face. Yeah, that's okay, but I understand cold feet. Yeah. No one to do cold feet now. 
So acute cold exposure has been shown to activate the vagus nerve and activate chlorogenic neurons um, through vagus nerve pathways. So as you see, the cold therapy, cold exposure and hydrotherapy, cold water immersion, when done on a consistent basis, acute exposure to the cold releases certain neurotransmitters in the gastrointestinal system that affects your brain health. So when you get in cold water, I've done this before, well, not in a cold, yeah, I have done, not in a cold pool, but I've done the snow, or we get in the hot tub though, and then we jump in the snow. But um, I've done even hot springs, you know, when you get into the warmth and then you're in the cold and back, yeah. But there's actually quite a lot of people doing this now. They're starting to go into ice baths like this. Yeah, it's incredible. And they're getting great results. Other studies have shown that an increase in vagus nerve activity caused by acclimatize, acclimatization to the cold booth, parasympathetic nervous system, which is important because that's what helps to lower your heart rate, slows it down. And it also helps with your gastrointestinal tract, relax, which we refer to rest and digest effect. Right? Well, the child looks like he's having fun, right? <laughs> and so then you have how to submerge your body up to your shoulders in a large full immersion tub with ice and water or go do with that gentleman is doing. <clears throat> Try finishing your next shower with at least 30 seconds of cold water. I did that yesterday and see how you feel. <laughs> it's invigorating. Then work your way up to longer periods of 60 seconds. It's shocking to do, but the lingering effects are worth it. If you can't do that, just start off with cold water to your face. This is wonderful. Gargling, that helps with your vagal tone. Maybe when you're gargling with um, mouthwash or you can even do like salt and water. That's very good as well. Singing, humming, well, we do that. Sound therapy, listening to the sound of running water, a water fountain, waterfowl, river, ocean waves. Exercise. Very important. One of the benefits of exercising has a vagus nerve stimulation is to your digestive health. Researchers have discovered that mild exercising promotes heavy, healthy, sorry, vagal tone. This helps to stimulate the gastric muscles leading to better digestion. Researchers have found that the stimulating the gut brain axis helps the stomach process food better. So here, after you eat, go for a walk, right? It really helps. We did that up at uh, Abide with the guests. Sunshine, wonderful. Exposure to sunlight, watch your sunrise and the sunset. Relaxation, mindfulness, deep restorative sleep. Not just sleep, deep restorative sleep. Gratitude, appreciation, loving, kind, compassionate, loving thoughts toward others and yourself. Prayer and meditation on God's words. Now, this is very common. Where do we find these remedies? Huh? Exactly. The eight laws of health. Yes. So we follow it. Guess what? You're going to have a high vagal tone, not a low one. And these are other ones too. So sit down during mealtime, eat in a relaxed state without distractions, chew food well. A lot of people just write it down their mouth. And, oh, they're out. Healthy, diversified, organic diet. Maintain a healthy gut and optimize digestion, which is so important. You can do that but with probiotic, massage, lymph massage, massage of the belly, visceral manipulation, deep breathing, chiropractic care, social engaging behaviors, hugging a friend or loved one, look in the eyes of your child, a dear friend, a pet. I love them with a deep sense of love and connectedness. Now, I wanted to say, what has happened during the lockdown? No connection. So a lot of people probably have very low vagal tones, which they couldn't handle stress. They got depressed. It just was gotten to snowball and got worse, didn't it? Foods, mega-3, 
You don't need to eat fish to get your omega threes. How do you get your omega threes? What do you have to eat? What up? Okay. What's the top one? No. Walnuts. Walnuts are your top one. But you know what else has omega three that no a lot of people don't like, especially children? Brussels sprouts. You can actually get in Brussels sprouts. Okay. Yeah. So one way to stimulate the vagus nerve naturally and benefit your heart rate is variability to feet to fast intermittently. Intermittent fasting is sometimes called the 5-2 diet. Involves eating normally for five days and then two on consecutive days having a partial fast calorie intake for the fasting days. Should be 500 calories for women and 600 calories for men. Studies have shown that intermittent fasting is an effective way to lose weight and maintain weight loss. The effects of fasting on the vagus nerve affect the hunger hormone, Gremlin. Other studies have shown that fasting is a way to stimulate the function of the vagus nerve. So it's very easy to stimulate this vagus nerve. Bottom line on the vagus nerve diet, eating food high in fiber, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, beans, and legumes is essential for regular bowel movement. So the removal of digestive food and toxins in stools prevent bad bacteria and other pathogens in the gut from thriving and impairing your vagus nerve. So fiber has the additional benefit of feeding the good bacteria in the gut, which reduces your inflammation and then also increases your vagus nerve activation. Deep breathing, who here deep breathes? My question is, do we breathe deeply the right way? Do we breathe from our lungs or should we breathe from our diaphragm? Our diaphragm, right. So let's try it. I want you to breathe in through your nose and now your abdomen is going to go out. You also on Zoom, do it too. Up, up and down. You want to do exercise? And then you breathe out through your nose. I mean, mouth, sorry. And your stomach should now go in. Okay? So that helps as well. <laughs> Probiotics affect the vagus nerve and improve gut function. So in some cases, stimulating the vagus nerve in the gut using probiotics can be a novel way to improve vagal tone. This can help to treat symptoms of vagus nerve dysfunction such as irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. Other studies have shown that vagus stimulation helps to make sure there is enough stomach acid for digestion. Vagus nerve function also affects levels of intrinsic factor is a type of protein known as IF in your gut, which is needed to prevent vitamin B12 deficiency. This is very important. There's a lot of people are deficient in B12, okay? One study found that taking lactobacillus could help to improve your gastrointestinal health because your gut's health also affects your mood and brain function. Through the vagus nerve, probiotics can also help to manage stress, anxiety, and depression. Massage, you can massage your vagus nerve. One of the benefits of having a massage to help you relax, it helps to increase vagal activity. There's also devices designed to stimulate the vagus nerve or sometimes used to control epilepsy seizures. However, massaging the carotid sinus on the sides of your neck can have a similar effect. And I can um, show you later how to do that. But I, I did say, if you do go to the YouTube, even people on Zoom, you see that site on YouTube, if you go there, he will show you how to massage it. But you have to be very careful because you do not want to be on the carotid artery, okay? It's lateral to the carotid artery. Oh, essential oils are very good as well. This is a really good anti-anxiety blend. There's coconut oil, bergamot. Bergamot is excellent orange, lavender. You can also add clary sage. And those are great. Um, those are very good for anxieties. And there are many ways you can use essential oils 
for calming, relaxing, and sedating effect. So you just make them with a carrying oil. I don't recommend to put it directly on your skin because you don't know if it can burn or get allergic reaction, but it's a lot of times if you use um, a carrying oil, then that will help. I don't understand why I keep emitting, but anyway, what's going on? So there's bergamot. Study on the calming effects of bergamot essential oil on rats found that sniffing the essential oil helps to stop anxious feelings. The researchers know that bergamot aromas have a similar effect to anti-anxiety medication like diazepam. There's quite a few people on this. I'm not to use this bergamot. One mental health clinic found that diffusing bergamot scent in their waiting room induced feelings of well-being and had a positive effect on mental health. I was going to do that today and see if you guys noticed anything, <laughs> but I didn't get to. Side effects and precautions, though. Although there are many essential oils for anxiety, it's important to remember that all essential oils are liquid containing highly concentrated compounds. Therefore, you should never apply essential oils undiluted to your skin to help relieve anxiety or treat other health conditions. So you can use coconut oil, sweet almond, virgin, jojoba oil, whichever. If you're pregnant, you speak with your doctor. Well, I'm sorry, you have to speak with somebody who knows about essential oils because a lot of doctors don't know anything about essential oils. <laughs> I like this picture. Other methods to stimulate your vagus nervous, laughing, right? And it's a good medicine. Where do we find that? In the Bible. Okay, so you look at, I love to hear babies laugh, you know, the little googly sounds, the mother, and I love the top one, a donkey. Have you ever heard a donkey laugh? It is hilarious. They do laugh. Another good way is by taking 5-HTP. It boosts your serotonin levels in the brain. I don't know if anybody here has taken 5-HTP. I have, and it does work. They can also assist in lowering depression, reducing hypertension, and boosting your mood. Okay, so this is a device that the doctors use now. Um, it's wired into the person and it's all connected. So that's what they use. However, there is a natural one if anybody's interested, is this one. So you could find this um, online. You can check that site out that I have at the top. That is the one if you're interested. However, I've given you many other um, you know, natural remedies or other alternatives that you can use that you don't even need that machine. We already should be doing these things and we should already have a high vagal tone anyway. If we're following the health message. So I wanna conclude this, Philippians 4, 6, 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which past all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So I pray that this was a blessing to you, um, brothers and sisters on Zoom and here as well, and that we can put this to practice and have a strong bagel tone and a close relationship with Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for that, Shelley. Now we're just going to get out of this presentation and get mine ready so i'm just going to pass it over to anya so she can organize it Presentations.
Is it a presentation? Sorry. Is it a presentation? Presentations. Presentations are down here. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Right. I'll leave that slide. This one? Yeah. Okay, well, welcome everyone to uh, church. Thank you for that presentation, Shelley. And hopefully we'll get our Vegas nerve working properly. So next week when she asks questions, we'll know the answer. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful body that we are fearfully made with. And, and we thank you for the laws that you've given us in the um, and the wisdom and understanding you give us through the spirit of prophecy in the Bible about how to look after ourselves. And we know, Lord, that what man is doing now, they're just catching up. And if only your people had have listened to you when you started revealing the health message to us in 1863, what a light we would be in this world today. And I pray, Father, that you will just help your people to um, understand the blessing that you want us to know through this health message. And so that we will indeed be the light that people will come to one day when they realise they can't trust humans anymore. We can lead them to you. I pray, Lord, as we begin to have a study into your word today, that you will guide us and lead us and give us wisdom and understanding through the scriptures. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, for some of you who, uh, who join, join us on Wednesday nights, we are going through the epistles of John. And... Uh, we're doing Second John chapter uh, verse one at the moment, and many of you have not, weren't, uh, haven't joined us. There's only me, Shelley, uh, Craig, and and uh, Annette who who joined us on um, Wednesday night, and a couple of others uh, who are who are, but most of you who are on Zoom now and who are here were not with us at that time. So I'm going to share with you what I presented on, um, on uh, Wednesday night. So the title of my message this morning is called The Elect Lady. So turn with me in your Bibles to 2 John verse 1. 2 John and verse 1. And it's going to be a Bible study today, so we're going to be opening our Bibles. We're not going to, I'm not going to have the, the Bible verses on, I'm going to have the, the references on the screen, but you've got to actually open your Bibles up and, and read from the Scriptures. <clears throat> so, except for, the, uh, uh, for this verse, which is the main verse of the, of the study. So, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only, not I only, but also all they that have known the truth. That's where I get the title of my message from today, the elect lady. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2 and to find out who this elect lady is as we go through our study today. Revelation 12 and verses 1 and 2. And it says here, and most of our study today will be in Revelation chapter 12, through to our uh, verse um, chapter 14. But we will also go to other places in the scripture. So, and there appeared on a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. So who is this woman? Now, we know in Bible prophecy, a woman represents a, a church, okay? So that's a bit of a hint. So stars are leaders. Remember, she had 12 stars on her, on her head, right? <coughs> so stars represent leaders. Patriarch, excuse me, and also the 12 children of Israel and the 12 apostles. I'm all right, I was just... <coughs> And the 12 apostles. Now, there's something interesting I, I was thinking of just this morning as I was, I was um, putting this, I mean, uh, as I was working through this, putting on PowerPoint. But just let me share this with you. 
So I've got here these letters here. Now what these letters represent is just the initials of, of some of the patriarchs. And there's actually 12, you would say 12 major patriarchs in the Bible. First one is Adam, then Seth, Enoch, Methuselah, Noah, then after the flood, Shem, and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Joseph, and Moses. These are the um, these are the main characters that we find in the book of Genesis. Thanks, Pania. And the first uh, few chapters of obviously the rest of the, the Pentateuch, which talks about Moses as well. So now what is the sun? Let's go to Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. What does the sun represent? Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. Now on, on the Zoom, we got a, on Wednesday, we got people to read them, read these verses, but because I'm preaching, I've got to quickly go to these verses myself. So Malachi chapter four, and sorry, will they be able to hear on, they can hear? Oh, okay. All right, well, Malachi four, um, actually it's not verse one, sorry, it is, uh, Sorry, I'm, I've got the wrong verse there. I've got the wrong verse there. Um, Malachi. Well, the one, the verse that says, "Then shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings." Well, that's Malachi chapter. Is it verse two? Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Malachi four verse verse two. Thank you. Fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the sword. Okay, thank you, Kenya. So the sun represents who? Jesus. We are clothed with the sun. Okay. The church is clothed with the sun. Now let's go to Genesis 1, verses 14 to 16. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14 to 16. I think it's better that if I read it, then I don't have to ask people. So Genesis 1, 14 to 16, it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for, for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. So here we say that there are two lights. There is a greater light and a lesser light. So what would the greater light be? What is the greater light in these verses? The sun, the sun right? So what would the lesser light be? The moon, the moon okay? So the, the woman had the moon under her feet. So if the greater light is Jesus, what would be the lesser light? Okay, let's see what the Bible says. Let's go to John chapter 1, verses 5 and uh, 1, verse 8, and 5, verse 35. So, John chapter 1 and verse 8 says this. This is John the Baptist speaking here. It says, He was. John chapter 1 and verse 8. And this is speaking of, of um, John the Baptist. It says, He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. So John the Baptist was not that light, but he came to bear witness of the light. Okay. Now let's go to chapter 5 and verse 35 and see what Jesus says of John the Baptist. John 5 and verse 35. He was a burning and shining light, and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So did Jesus say John the Baptist was a light? Yes. 
So what was John the Baptist? He was the, the lesser light that was leading to the greater light. But what was John the Baptist? What was he? A prophet. Okay. So the words of the, the prophets are the lesser light leading to the greater light, who is Jesus. And is Ellen White a um, lesser light? Yes, she is. She's a lesser light leading to the, the greater light, Jesus, as well. Okay. Now, let's now go to Psalm 119 and verse 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. And this is a well-known verse. We probably don't even know, need to go to read this verse. But it says here, Psalm 119 and verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, do we need a lamp today? Do we need a lamp now? No. When do we need a lamp? At night. So what is the lamp at night that God has provided for us? What is the lamp that God has provided for us at night? Or what is the light God has provided for us at night? The moon. Okay. So the moon represents the words of the prophet, which lead us to, to Christ. Okay. All right. Now let's move on. Oh, we've looked at Psalm 109 and 105. So let's go back now to Revelation 12 and verse 1. Revelation 12 and verse 1. Okay. So here she is a woman. She is clothed with the sun. And she has a moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars. <clears throat> now, let's go to Genesis 3, verse 15. Remember, she is a woman. So who is this woman? Or what do we know about this woman? When did this woman first appear in the Bible? Genesis 3 and verse 15. And it says here, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, who is this woman? <clears throat> is it Eve? Is it Eve? Okay. Some say it's Eve. Sorry? A can, yeah. So who do some people believe the woman of Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 is? Mary, okay. So is it Mary? No, it is the woman. The woman is the, the church. So the woman was the church right from the beginning. So God's church has been right from the beginning of time. And as I said, it was Adam, then it was Enoch and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Joseph, Moses, and then God established the, the children of Israel. Okay, now let's go to Revelation 12 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. And we're going to see something here. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. I'm going to have to put my thing in here there so I can quickly go back to it. Okay, Revelation 12 and verse 4, it says here, oh, actually, we, we missed a verse. Um, let's go down to verse 2. I'm not sure why verse 2 isn't there, in there. And it says, And she, being with child, cried to railing in birth and, and pain to be delivered. So the woman or the church was crying for this for a child to be born and to be delivered. Now, who is that child? Jesus. That's the one that God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. It, that's the, the enmity, that's the, 
their promise will bruise Satan's head. Okay, and who was the one that bruised Satan's head? Jesus. Remember Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He said, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. But now let's go to verse 4 of Revelation 12. And it says that Satan tried to devour, stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. So did Satan love this child? No. Satan is an enmity with this child. And what did he try to do with the woman? He tried to destroy the woman so the child would not be born. Now, did Satan try to destroy the nation of Israel? Yes, he did. <laughs> he tried to he got it in, he tried to get into apostasy, into in all these things. He used the enemies, he used other nations to, to try and destroy the child, destroy the woman, but it was never destroyed until it fulfilled its mission in bringing forth the man child, which was Jesus. Okay. All right. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. And I'm not going to go to the verse, but it says, When the fullness of time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. So when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son through the woman or through Israel. Now let's go again to Revelation 12 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 5. We're looking at the elect lady. Now, after the child was caught up to heaven, oh, sorry, now this, this we're reading, sorry. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So Jesus was victorious over Satan and he was caught up to God and to his throne to be with his father again. Now, what happened after that? Did Satan just go, oh, I've lost, <laughs> you know, that's it. <laughs> did he do that? No. What did he do? Chapter 12, verse 13, it says, And when the dragon saw that he was cast out to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the male child. So in other words, he persecuted the church. Okay. Now let's go to verse 6. Revelation 12, verse 6. And what did the woman do uh, when she was being persecuted? It said she fled into the wilderness where God had a place prepared for her that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now what's that? What's, what do we call that time period? Dark Ages or the time of papal supremacy. So the woman fled into the wilderness because she's being persecuted. Who is she being persecuted by? Sorry? Satan, yeah? The, the papal church, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, what is the Roman Catholic Church in the Bible? A harlot. So what is she? What is it? I gave it away. A woman. So there was another woman persecuting God's woman. Okay? So we see Satan's woman persecuting God's woman. Okay. Now let's go to verses 15 and 16 and see what God did. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. In other words, he tried to destroy the church. And the earth helped the woman. Now, who does the earth represent in the Bible? If we go to Revelation chapter 13, who is the earth? The United States of America. So God provided asylum for the, Alan White says, God provided asylum for the Christian church in the United States of America to flee the persecution of the, the churches of Europe. Okay. Carried away by the flood, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And then we go to verse 17. So the earth helped the woman, but Satan's still not happy. And so in verse 17, it says, 
And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of the seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here we see God's woman in the last days. All right. Now let's go to Luke 18 and verse 8. Luke 18, oh, we don't have to go to it. Jesus asked the question in Luke 18, verse 8. When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Now, what is the answer to that question? Yes or no? Let's see what the Bible says. Let's go, go to Revelation 13 now and verse 10. Revelation 13 and verse 10. So even though this persecuting power of the sea beast or Babylon, the woman, in Revelation chapter 13, verse 10, had made war with the saints, according to Revelation 13 and verse 7, in verse 10, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So was Satan persecuting the church? Did he use this woman to persecute the church? Was he victorious? No, because here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now we come to the last days. The dragon is wroth with the woman and making war with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Revelation 14 and verse 12 and see the characteristic of this church. So who, who is going into captivity here? It is the papacy. Okay, so let's go now to Revelation 14 and verse 12, a very well-known verse. And it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Yes, he's going to find it in these people. Okay, now the question is, who are these in contrast with or in contrast to? Who is Revelation 14 verse 12 in contrast to? Those who don't keep the commandments of God. Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. Those who receive the mark of the beast. Okay. And that's Revelation 14 verse 9 to 11. So now we see there's a... There's a a contest between those who have the mark of the beast and those who, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Who are the ones that are going to be victorious? Revelation 15, verses 2 and 3. Revelation 15 and verses 2 and 3 says, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and then that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing a new song. Oh, sorry. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. So here's a group of people that have overcome the, the mark of the beast. They did not receive the mark of the beast. And they are standing on the sea of glass. And they are singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Okay, so who are these people? Let's go to Revelation 14, verses 1 to 5. Revelation 14 and verses 1 to 5. And it says here, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder, and heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Does that sound like Revelation 15? And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. Now, what women, were, what women defile? Would a good woman defile? Would a whore defile? Who is the whore? Babylon. So she was not defiled by Babylon. Okay, these people are not defiled by Babylon. 
for they are virgins. They are they which follow the Lamb with the so ever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So here we see a group of people called the 144,000. They are the ones that did not receive the mark of the beast. They are the ones who would not be defiled with this woman Babylon. They are the ones who follow the lamb or follow Jesus wherever he goes or do whatever he, he says. They are without guile. Now, what is guile? Lies. So if they're without guile, what is coming out of their mouth? Truth. Okay, keep that in mind. Okay, now let's have another look at these 144,000. Let's go to Revelation chapter... Oh, sorry. So Revelation chapter 7. I pressed the button too much, sorry. I'm going the wrong way. Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 to 4. Revelation chapter 7 and verses 2 to 4. And it says here, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 140 and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So these people received the seal of the living God. The 144,000 had the seal of the living God. Now, question is, what is the seal of the living God in contrast to? You'd say the mark of the beast, right? Okay, so what is the seal? And what is the mark? Well, the seal and the mark is the Sabbath or Sunday. So the Sabbath is the seal. The mark of the beast is Sunday. Now, let's keep this in mind as we continue to look at Revelation 7. So we're going to read now verses 5 to 8. Now, the 144,000 were of the tribe of the children of Israel. And then it goes through the list of these tribes. And we're not going to look at them, but there are two tribes that are missing in these, in these verses. And what are those two tribes that are missing? It is Dan and Ephraim, okay? Dan and Ephraim are the ones that are missing. So why are Dan, Dan and Ephraim not there? Let's now go to Judges chapter 18. 18. Judges 18 and verse 30. And we're going to have a little glimpse to see why Dan and Ephraim aren't there. Judges 18 and verse 30. It's actually, you know what? It's actually been a while since I preached a sermon where, where I'm actually opening the Bible up. <laughs> so it's... it's um. It, that's why it's taking a, a little bit longer. I'm not used to um, opening the Bible up while I'm preaching for a while. So I think I might have to get in the habit a bit more. Judges 18 and verse 30 says, And the children of Dan set up the graven image, and Jonathan the son of Gershom, he were priests to the tribe. Now, a brother brought this up on... um. On, on Wednesday, was it you or Craig or was it George? It was about judges, about the tribe of Dan. I think it was George that brought it up. But what was the problem with Dan? They had idolatry and they set up another priesthood in opposition to the priesthood that was at Shiloh. Now let's go to Genesis 30 and verse 5 and 6. Genesis chapter 30. And verses 5 and 6. And Bilhah conceived, that's Rachel's uh, handmaid, Bilhah conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me and hath also heard my voice and hath given me a son. Therefore called she his name 
Dan. And if you look down on um, the in the thing, it says Dan means judge or judge me. So Dan means judge. And in the Daniel's name is God is my judge. So is there a church? And that's the reason why Dan will not be there because he's in no idolatry and he judges God's people. Is there a church that has idolatry and its own priesthood and set its judge over other churches and even the world? Yes, there is. Okay. Now let's go to Hosea chapter 4 and verse 17. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 17. And now we're going to look at the frame, E frame. So Hosea chapter 4 and verse 17. And it says here, Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. Sorry, Hosea 4, verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols, let him alone. So Ephraim was joined to his idols. Now, Israel was also called Ephraim. And who is Israel today? It would be spiritual Israel, or it would be the church, right? So the church, but Ephraim was a church that was in idolatry. What is the idol that the Protestant churches are holding on to and not letting go of? Sunday. Okay. Now, let's go to Daniel 11 and verse 44 and 45. Daniel 11 verses 44 and 45, just a few pages back from, from where we were looking at in Hosea. Daniel 11, 44 and 45. And it says, but tidings out of the east. Now, where did the seal of the living God come from? The east. Tidings out of the east and out of the north. What is in the north? God's throne. Okay. Tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the sea and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So this is the, the papacy planting the Sunday worship in the, the world. And it is going forth with great fury to destroy and make away many people. Now, who is Israel or apostate Protestantism called today? What is another name for the Roman Catholic Church or in the Bible? Babylon, right, Babylon, okay. So let's go to Revelation 17, 13 and 14 and see what Babylon is doing. And remember, the papacy or the king of the north is going forth with great fury to destroy and make away many. And let's see what Revelation 17 and verses 13 and 14 tell us. And it says here, these have one mind and shall give their power and their strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. So we see that Satan is going to make and these kings of the north, uh, kings of the earth, along with the beast are going to make war with the lamb. But where is the lamb now? In heaven. So how can they make war with Jesus in heaven? They're making war with his people on earth. And it says here, they that are with him or with Jesus and those who follow the lamb with us wherever he goeth are the call, the chosen and faithful. So would you call these people the elect? Amen. Now, what will happen to some of these elect? Revelation 20 and verse 4 it says that they will be beheaded. Those who do not worship the beast and receive his mark, some of them will be beheaded. 
Now, Matthew 24 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24 tells us this. And this is taking us back to um, 2 John. Matthew 24 and verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Okay. So who would be the very elect today? Would it be those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? The called, the chosen and faithful? Now, if someone deceives you with words, what is it? So, okay, if someone's deceiving you with words, what is it? Very, very simple answer. A lie. <laughs> okay, it's a lie, right? Okay, now what is the opposite of lies? Truth. Okay, now let's see, going back to 2 John verse 1, what the elect lady has. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all they also that have known the truth. So what does the elect lady have? She has the truth. Okay. Now, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to look at at start with verses three to six ephesians four verses three to six and it says here endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace there is one body and one spirit even as ye are called into one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So according to this verse, how many gods are there? One. Okay. And who is that? That is the God of Israel. How many truths are there? One. There is only one truth. And does the elect lady have that one truth? Yes, she does. Now let's see what we read from verses 11 to 16. And he, that's the spirit, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. Now, would you say these are leaders in the church? Yes. And what is the purpose of these leaders in the church? Verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slate of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive so here we see that god has set the leaders up in the church to keep the people in the unity of the faith to keep people in the truth to help them not be carried away with every wind of doctrine by the slate of man and cunning craftiness how much truth do you how much truth do you or how so let me rephrase how much of a lie do you need to to present to not have 100 percent truth one percent <laughs> so you can preach 99 percent truth and one percent lie and you are deceiving people so is it very important that you know what the truth is is it very important that the elders and the leaders of the church know what the truth is and preach that truth and unfortunately is that the case no there is so much error and deception amongst us at the elect church today that um that it is very frightful. 
Let's keep reading. So, so how do we counteract this error? It says, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up into him in all things which is ahead, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in a measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So you see, brothers and sisters, we need the truth to be united together in love. If I don't have the truth, and I'm not saying this for everybody, so I don't, I'm not saying this is the case with everybody who doesn't have truth, but if I, I don't have truth, what will I eventually not, want, not have toward my brother and sister? Love. Now, I may have it now, but eventually, truth and, and error cannot mix with each other. And so, and this is what we see in apostate Protestantism. Like, like Daniel, Damien said this morning in Sabbath school, you know, he's trying to share the truth with the, this, this person and he just did not want to hear it and he just had hatred towards him, you know? And so if we continue on in error, then eventually that love within us will grow cold. So brothers and sisters, let us be sure that we have the truth and let us be sure that we edify one another in that truth so we can grow up in the love of God.
Sorry about that. For those of you who are on Zoom, um, we lost power. So we're just getting it back set up now. We're almost we're almost to the end now. So um, only a few more verses to look at and then we'll be, be finished. Do you need to see that one yet? Yeah, I don't know. That's it. Yeah, that's yet. all right. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so we can see here that God wants to bring us all together in love, but through the, through the truth. And this is very important. Now, let's go back to 2 John. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 4. And it's, so let's read 2 John verses 1 to 4. The elder unto the elect lady. And now who we found out it's the elect lady? It's God's remnant church. Those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus Christ and who love the truth. The elect lady unto the, the elder unto the elect lady and their children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all they that have known the truth. For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you and mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. You see love and truth together. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in the truth as we have received commandment from the Father. And brothers and sisters, I rejoice greatly that, that we are here rejoicing in the truth of God. And brothers and sisters, let us rejoice in God's truth. Because it is the truth that sets us free. It is the truth that keeps us from the error of the wicked. It is the truth that keeps us from Babylon and the mark of the beast. Now let's go to, over to 3 John verse 4. And it says, and um, my, my thoughts are the same as this verse towards John, towards the children of, of um, the church in his day. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. There is no greater joy to me to see people walking in God's truth because I know what that truth has done for me. It got me out of Babylon. It got me into understanding if I didn't know the truth, I would not be here with you today. If I didn't know the truth about health, I wouldn't be here with you today. If I didn't know the truth about how to surrender my life to God, I wouldn't be here with you today. I would either be dead, in jail, in a, a mental asylum, or, or sick in a hospital. That's where I would be today, if, if you knew what my life was before I came to Jesus and before I learned to listen to Jesus. Okay, Genesis 3, verse 15. We've already read it, but right back at the beginning, God said that he will put enmity between thee and the woman. So the woman was right there from the beginning. Now let's go to Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 7 and 8. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. What is the ultimate outcome to this woman? We have seen her being persecuted. We have seen her being victorious. We hear, we've seen the declaration of God. Here is the patience of the saints. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 says this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Who is his wife? The church. Amen. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So God's church, faithful, true church, will be found with the righteousness of Christ. Now, there's a very, two very interesting verses I want us to look at in Jeremiah before we look at our final three verses of our study today in Revelation. Revela uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 6. And I'm, I've shared this with you before, but some of you may not have, have heard me sharing this before. So Jeremiah 23 and verse 6 says this. 
And in his day shall Judah be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Now let me re read this verse again. In his day shall Judah be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called. This is whose name? His name. Whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So who's the Lord our righteousness? Jesus. So his name is called the Lord our righteousness. Now let's go to chapter 33 and verse 16. 33 and verse 16. In those days shall Judah be saved and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. Similar words, right? And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. In chapter 33, verse 6, it's where he shall be called Jesus, the Lord our righteousness. But in these verses, it's where she shall be called. What is a she? A woman. And the woman is the, the church. So she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So whose righteousness is the righteousness of the saints? It's Christ's righteousness. It's his righteousness in us. Amen. So the Lord, our righteousness, will become our righteousness. And this is the name whereby the church will be called. And this is why in Revelation 19, verse 8, it says, it is the righteousness of the saints. Okay. So Revelation 12, verse 11. So let's go and look at these final verses of Revelation we're going to look at in our study today. Revelation 12 and verse 11. It says here, And they overcame him, that Satan, by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Brothers and sisters, let us overcome by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 14, 12. Jesus is one day going to say, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And that question of Jesus, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth, will be answered in his church. And I pray that each and every one of us will be a part of that church. And when, if we are alive until Jesus comes back, we will see his glorious coming. But in Revelation 14, verse 13, if we do die... We have this promise. And I heard another voice saying, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the spirits, that they may rest, saith the spirits, sorry, that they may rest from their labor and their works do follow them. If we die in the faith of the third angel's message, we have the promise that we will wake up in a special resurrection and see Jesus, the, see the final events of this earth and see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. And all of us will be alive to be able to say in Revelation 25, verse 9, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us and we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So let us as the woman of Revelation 12, that elect lady of 2 John, verse 1, let us be faithful to God, remain faithful to Jesus, and one day when Jesus comes back, we will be able to rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Now we're going to final uh, close with the final hymn, which is uh, 260 in this book and 520 in the, um, in the, uh, the book we're reading, hymn we're reading from today. And it's what a wonderful saviour, is it? Yeah. What a wonderful saviour we have. And I, and I asked Craig to choose some hymns. He didn't know what I was going to be preaching on. And this, this hymn actually goes very well with our sermon today. We serve a wonderful Saviour. Five twenty in the uh, SDA hymnal.
Indeed, what a wonderful Saviour is Jesus, our Lord. And Father, we are looking forward to that day when we will be clothed in your brightness and the righteousness of Christ. And dear Lord, we are living in a battleground at the moment. And you want us to be united in the unity of the faith, the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace speaking the truth in love that we may grow up into the likeness of Jesus in our lives and in our hearts. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us, Lord, to overcome whatever it may be in our lives by the blood of the Lamb. And that if there are any errors or that we may not be caught up in any errors of the wicked because we have the word of the truth in our lives so father thank you for this time that we've had today we thank you that one day jesus is going to be able to say here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of god and have the faith of jesus and i pray that each and every one of us who are on zoom and here today will be part of that group and that one day when jesus does come back 
for those of us who've gone through the time of trouble and for those who are, will wake up in the special resurrection, we will be able to say, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. He will save us and we will rejoice in his salvation. May we truly rejoice in his salvation today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.